Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have Cheryl. In this episode, we will be talking about the correlations between the strong interest inventory and the Myers-Briggs instrument. And so the strong interest inventory is a tool that you can use to figure out your career interests and where your interests lie in case you're trying to figure out certain career paths you might be wanting to investigate more or learn more about. And so what better person to bring on than Cheryl, an instructor of these two instruments? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with me. Would you like to tell us a bit about you? Yeah. Well, thanks for having me here, Joyce. It's really, a, it's an honor to work with you. I've enjoyed watching your YouTube channel on and off over the years. And um, so it's just great to be Part of the conversation. Um, I currently am a consultant in the strong interest inventory. That is primarily the instrument I teach. Um, and I work for GS Consultants, who is the, um, the certifying body that the publisher hires to certify people in the strong interest inventory. Um, I also work with Myers-Briggs a lot, and I teach um, workshops on using the MBTI and the strong together. And so that overlap that we're going to talk about today is one uh, area that I really enjoy learning about, thinking about, and also seeing manifest in the, the lives of the folks I get to work with. So that's what I'm doing right now. My background is higher ed. I've been working in is either a career counselor or an administrator in the education field, um, two and four year colleges and universities, as well as public and private. So I've had my mitts in every possible educational setting. And that was the work I was doing before I um, moved full time to becoming a trainer and a consultant. So, and I get to work with folks in Canada quite a bit as well as the U S but also all over the world. So it's really an honor to be training people, you know, literally because most of it's online and it even was before the pandemic. Um, through the online vehicle, it doesn't matter where people are and they can get certified in the strong and of course in the MBTI. <laughs> That's amazing. She is an INTJ. I believe that is your best fit type. <laughs> that, is, that is. Yeah. And so Cheryl, could you tell us a bit about the strong interest inventory? Yeah. For folks who don't know about it. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's, so it's actually the granddaddy of career assessments. Um, it's been around since the 1920s. And um, it's cool because it's continuously updated over the decades because it's normed on um, the U.S. population, but it's also very applicable in any Western country, um, really. But what's so cool about it is it's, it's the oldest career assessment out there. It's got the highest reliability and validity standards you could possibly meet. But it's also, as I mentioned, in some ways it's the newest because the publisher takes the time to continually update it to make sure it's current. And the cool thing about the strong, it doesn't just look at your interests and um, the world of work and what might be a good fit for you, but it also does touch on personality as well, which is why it's such a great blend with um, MBTI and using type with, with the strong. I like to say that the, the strong is a career assessment that has personality implications. And then the MBTI is a personality assessment that has career implications along with lots of other implications. As you know, the MBTI is, any topic you can get there, whether it's communication, you know, relationships, leadership, you know, how you deal with change, yada, yada, yada. So the MBTI is this really big global instrument through the lens of personality, but the two do link up really well. And um, so it's nice to have, and they're very different instruments in terms of how they're developed and, and um, how you get your results. I mean, they come at it completely differently. So it's cool when two very different instruments are pointing kind of in the same direction. Absolutely. That's where you see a lot of validity coming from when two separate instruments are saying the same thing, but yeah. they didn't communicate with each other. It's almost like a double blind. When wow. you have two separate schools of thought coming to the same conclusion, it means they didn't influence each other with coming to the conclusion, but they still arrived at the same truth. Yeah. It shows yeah. that there's some sort of underlying truth behind it all. Yeah. yeah. For it, sure. 
Yeah, and so Cheryl is a master MBTI practitioner, and she's also the person who certified me in the strong interest inventory tool. So she is very knowledgeable about these two instruments. And it's going to be really cool to dive into the similarities and differences in the mm -hmm. correlations and overlaps between these two instruments. Before we go into that, though, Cheryl, I'd like to ask you about the heart of type. So in your opinion, what is the most important part of the Myers-Briggs code? Well, I think once you have verified your best fit type, I really do believe heart of type is where we reside mostly. I feel because once we understand through type development and type dynamics, how complicated type is, right? It's not just a static sort of set of letters. Once we appreciate that and can see the nuanced differences between people, it's still heart of type where we reside above all. Um, as I mentioned, I like to call it our operating system. And so for me as an NT, I'm really motivated by global systems, mastering knowledge, um, really high standards of competence are important to me. I mean, that's, that's how I'm made. And that's even how I was as a little kid, you know, once I can reflect back on my younger self and knowing that about myself, that is kind of the nugget for the career conversation, which then the strong can help to flesh out. So I think heart of type because that's also where our growth happens, right? As we get older, hopefully we mature and we start exploring other ways of being. We're, we're adjusting uh, or experimenting with heart of type or, you know, we're experimenting in that inner sanctum. For me as a NT, sliding over to NF is a very safe way to practice something new because I'm still anchored on half of my heart of type or sliding over, you know, instead of keeping the, the N, I'd keep the T, right? And I would slide over a different direction to pick up, experiment with some, some sensing. Um, but I just feel like once we understand how to type, we know our safe place and we also know how to safely explore new ways of being, trying out yeah. new behaviors. Absolutely, that is a really great way of putting it, Cheryl. And so for those who don't know, heart of type is the middle of your code. So the middle of your code is NF, ST, SF, NT. This is the meat. This is the substance of your code. It's also mm -hmm. where your functions lie. So feeling, thinking, sensing, intuiting. The middle of your code is, is where it is. The, the bulk yeah. of your personality, the operating system, as Cheryl puts it. And the outer two letters, so the E and I, P and J, so extroversion, introversion, perceiving, judging. These are modifiers on your the, the heart of your code. It's what causes like the cognitive functions almost, if you see it that way. Yeah. So for those of you who are super nerdy, the middle of your code is the foundation of your type. And the outer two letters change the attitude of your functions. Mm -hmm. The outer two are kind of like signposts, like they, they help you understand direction and um, expression, but they're not, they're not your inside. They're more like, I see them more as directional and they help you understand how your inside expresses and works. And um, does that make sense? That makes 10,000% sense. Yeah. <laughs> so if you share the NF temperament with someone, so the middle of your code, the heart of your type, says NF, then you actually share a lot of qualities with them, even if the E and I and the J and P mm -hmm. are different. Mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of people in type might disagree with that because they're like, but you have completely opposite cognitive functions if your J and P are different. And that is true. I believe our cognitive functions are our cognitive reasoning. So let's say like an INFP and an INFJ have completely opposite cognitive reasoning for why they arrive at certain conclusions. Mm -hmm. But the heart of type, their operating system is still founded upon the core psychological needs of the NF temperament or the right. heart of type, which is within your code. And so I find although types can be very different because of the functions, 
if they have in their top two functions or in their higher up stack, like NF yeah. functions, they're going to be more similar than they are different. From just interviewing people, I find that to be true in the case. And they, they share actually a common language. Like the language of, of NF is about empowerment, making a difference in people's lives, helping people fulfill their own potential. Like that, it, that is NF. That's NF language. It's NF thinking. Now, how that's expressed might vary. Which which uh, function it comes first and second, that can vary, but still you shake it up and that's what an NF looks like. That is so cool. <laughs> oh, right? Yeah, I 100% agree. That sounds like my soul in a short sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, my partner's NF, so I've, I, uh, I have the, the privilege of witnessing what NFs look like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the middle of your code, so the NF for the NFs is like your DNA mm -hmm. and the outer two letters are like your epigenetics. They're changes based on mm -hmm. the specific type you are within that type, but it's it doesn't make a huge, huge difference, but right. it makes a difference. Right. Um, yeah, you know, I 10,000% agree. That's not even a number. I just, <laughs> I don't know if your NT competency was okay with me creating a new percentage, but all right. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering, do you know what ST and SF language are? Like what language do the, those heart of type share? Sure. So what I would describe ST language and um, would be really about accuracy and getting things right. Um, doing things with efficiency. They're the pragmatists. Um, and if they're going to be using information or details, it's in a very kind of efficient, pragmatic way. So they're really driven to get things right and that accuracy. So that's what I would describe STs. And then SFs, um, my mom is an SF, so I learned from the best. Um, uh, SFs are really about providing practical service. So making a difference in people's lives, but in very tangible, practical ways. That's food for thought. I think that's a certain point the community should incorporate more in how it thinks about type. Uh -huh. uh, that the middle two letters, it shows your mother tongue or your joint mm -hmm. language with people who share the middle of your code. Yeah. And the outer two are just things that change up how that's expressed, but the core personality almost is is the middle too and yeah. you well it's really that. fun to do like you know in workshops and activities when you have a group you know and you do kind of like the living type table exercises so the people kind of are oriented either into the quadrants or the columns but you know the columns are the heart of type on the type table and then you can do really fun communication activities and have the sfs try to talk to the nts <laughs> And it doesn't matter if you're an ENTJ or an INTP or, you know, it, the NT still, they have a way they communicate. And so it's just really fun to, to see people like miscommunicating or how they have to change up their language to be heard. So there's a lot of laughs and a lot of like, oh, yeah, those kinds of moments. That is a really good tip, yeah. So if you facilitate the 16 types in an organization, mm -hmm. a cool activity you might wanna consider is grouping people in terms of NT, NF, ST, SF. You might get really interesting team results of people trying to communicate with each other. <laughs> yeah, right. that, that's amazing. That's an amazing yeah. way to create interesting team activities where people can learn a lot about how their minds are so different than each mm -hmm. other and how to respect those differences in a way that helps everyone grow into the best version of themselves. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why we need each other because we're like blinders on, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so Cheryl, I would love to ask you about the correlations between the strong interest inventory. So this is a career tool for those who are new to it and the Myers-Briggs instrument. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, one is 
really a, cur a career instrument that has personality implications. That's the strong. And then the MBTI is the, the opposite. It's a personality instrument with career implications. So one of the main scales on the strong that has a really high relationship or correlation with um, type is the first scale on the strong called the general occupational theme scale or the general themes. And um, some of you might be familiar with Holland's hexagon, John Holland, he was a, a vocational psychologist and he believed that people were a combination of a couple themes and work environments are also a, typically a combination of those same themes and they're realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising and conventional. So it's R-I-A-S-E-C. And some people call it the Ryasek hexagon. And I don't know if Joyce, you can, you know, show an image of this. Um, you can edit that in, but that might be helpful. So these general themes, the theory is that it's not only about the work environment, but it's also about the person. And so that scale on the strong is the personality scale of the strong. And it looks at who you are and what your core motivations are, which is what heart of type does. It's about who you are and really what motivates you. So those two are a really great blend. Some of the common correlations, and you probably won't be surprised that social is the theme on the strong that has the highest correlation with SF because it's really about helping. Social is driven to help. NFs, in terms of type, the highest theme they correlate with is a artistic. Now, of course, there's lots of other core, there's lots of other relationships, but these are some of the primary ones. Um, my Holland themes, my highest ones are uh, IA, so investigative and artistic. Mm -hmm. And NT is the heart of type that correlates most strongly with investigative. So for me, it's, you know, there's a fit, a natural fit right there because investigative people are driven to analyze, to question. It's a very NT kind of activity. So with the strong, you change over time. With type, you know, we believe more once you verify type, it's really acknowledge, acknowledging your genetic imprint. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we grow and change over time and Myers-Briggs, the MBTI might, might pick up on that, but your type hasn't changed. But the strong, you are actually measuring change because it's measuring the socialized self so how life has impacted you, type would be nature, strong would be nurture, whether it's yeah. family nurture or, or culture, or, you know, society. Really cool. Yeah. And yeah. A few so other ones? Do you want me to share a few other of the correlations? Absolutely. Okay. Some of the other ones, it's interesting that ST correlates with three of the themes on the hexagon. And I don't know, though, if that's because the propensity of STs in culture, like in the U.S. culture, ST is the highest percentage of heart of type mm -hmm. in the United States. I don't know if it's that way in Canada. So I don't know if it's just that there's more ST people, but STs correlate with R, C, conventional and e enterprising so realistic conventional enterprising so the doers the um the organizers and the leaders those all come up with high sts as their heart of type fascinating does sf only correlate with social <laughs> that's the one it comes up in a statistically significant way yeah so that's the uh, the one that sfs do although yeah. i in practice i see a lot of sfs also have r have that realistic that hands-on helping mm. yeah that makes a whole lot of sense yeah and so with the nfs is it the is the only correlation artistic or is there another correlation it's, it's artistic first and then social second so those are the mm. common ones for nfs yeah. And then for the NTs, you mentioned investigative. Mm -hmm. Is there any other correlation as well with NTs? Yeah. The second highest cor correlation is with artistic. So oh. it kind of makes sense because it's more of the, you know, the abstractions and the, the more theoretical global kind of thinking as opposed to thinking that matters or actually you can use <laughs> novel idea. <laughs> so NTs tend to be, you know, like, wow, bigger picture. And then depending on if you're a 
like an INTJ myself, you can be pretty darn well sure I'm going to actually execute it and get it done. But that's not always the case. That is true. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Huh. <laughs> that is fascinating. Yeah. Um, what implications would you say this has on career choices for yeah. the heart of type or for, for mm -hmm. people? Well, I know, especially with um, adults, when they're coming to look at a career change or returning back to school um, to just to re, re career um, completely, I find that when I have the conversation with them using both the hexagon and heart of type around what motivates them, if they've been in the workforce for a while, that is what really impacts them because they're realizing the work they've been doing has not been a fit for really how they're made. Mm -hmm. They've been doing work for the sake of working and uh, um, the belief that somehow they can have a career that fits who they are. Uh, I had one client um, say how wonderful it would be if the inside of their skin, so who they are, matched the outside of their skin, meaning what they were doing. And to have that kind of congruency, like they just almost couldn't couldn't fathom that something like that was was possible for them because mm -hmm. they had been doing so much um, work for so long that was incongruent with who they were. And mm -hmm. so for people who are new to this kind of language of uh, understanding self and understanding the world of work, this notion of fit and how you explore that, it's really, really powerful. That and, is beautiful. And especially with adults, maybe who are coming to type for the first time, you know, then if they're in their 30s or 40s, let's say, you know, they're already, as you know, in process of probably some type development. And then so verifying type is even more can be even more challenging because they're already progressing perhaps on that journey. And, um, you know, I had one individual who I was working with, he, um, his, re his results were um, IST, ISTJ. And when we verified type, he was an INFP reported type ISTJ verified type INFP. So it was like who he had become was his mm -hmm. reported type. Mm -hmm. who he was and had never really had a chance to get to know was INFP. Mm. So it's almost like he didn't know that about himself because he was put into a spot, a slot really early on in life, was told to go to college to major in such and such, went into the military you know, um, so, and then with the strong on top of it, really looking at his work environments that were a great fit for him, he came up really with his, his Holland code was a ASC, artistic and social and conventional. And, you know, just through the conversation, realizing that that conventional part of his personality on the strong really was tied to that ST in terms of how he was trained to be as a human being almost. But that A, S in him on the strong, the artistic and the social really aligned with who, how he was made as a INFP. So it was like putting the brakes on his life in some ways, but then recalibrating it so that it actually fit in a true way. Mm. So our upbringing really affects our results on instruments sometimes. Mm -hmm. The example you gave, it seems like he had natural preferences for INFP, but when he would take a test, he would turn out ISTJ because mm -hmm. he was kind of made to score that way because of his environment kind of made him answer that way. So it shows that self-reporting requires someone to check over your, your result as well because when you have like a someone else, like a third party kind of double checking to make sure yeah. not some third factor is throwing off your result, like yeah, high wire yeah. to another side, it helps it become more accurate. There's a term called intuitive blending. So sometimes intuitives will blend to 
appear more sensorial because mm -hmm. most of the world is sensory. And oh, so yeah. to survive as a necessity, sometimes intuitives will pseudo rely on their sensing functions right? because there wasn't really an option, it felt like. So sometimes people yeah. feel the necessity to adapt. And in the case that you mentioned too. Yeah, so it really, you know, both of these instruments, um, there is, you know, they can really tender conversations can happen, right? It's it's so much more than just learning about yourself. I mean, that's fun right there in, in and of itself. But um, the way it, the information can support and impact your life and the choices you're making, you know, it's pretty powerful. And not just for working adults, but also for, you know, high, uh, high school students, college students, university students. So the, you know, the great thing about both these instruments is that they can be used across, across the lifespan. I mean, even when people are uh, d career disengaging, so they're getting ready to retire. Both of these instruments, right, have so much to offer about what what's next for the next stage. You know, who do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? What makes you happy right now? So. Mm. What lights up your soul? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's always good to know what fuels you, what gives you energy, what puts you in your flow state, what makes yeah. you love life, what makes you grateful to be alive. Yeah. These type of instruments can point you towards the right direction. So they get you thinking. They implore introspection. They're like, this is the place where you can start really thinking about what is in alignment with your truest self. Right. And if you've been living outside of alignment and that's why maybe you're depressed or you're feeling lost or feeling a lack of purpose, sometimes it comes from living in a way that's not in accordance to who you really are. Like you've been living outside yourself. And so a lot of people's lives are about reclaiming their true essence or reclaiming like the person they were meant to be, you know, the, yeah. the U.S. them at their core. Yeah. Yeah. And so these tools are little guides. Everything in life is a guide yeah. towards getting you closer to who you were meant to be. If you just pay more attention to it, everything is like a signal telling you more about yourself. And right. these signals are so important to understanding the heart of who you are. The, the heart, like it, 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 you know, I think heart of type is such a good way of putting it because it's like your beating heart. So right. like what makes your heart beat? I don't know. What, what would you want your heart to be for? <laughs> I don't know. Right. What is worth that passion in your life? Linda Behrens calls it purpose work. Mm -hmm. So what is your purpose work? And like everything in life is kind of like giving you a little clue into what your purpose work is. And these tools, like the strong interest inventory, uh, it allows you to know, it, it gives you little whiffs into what your purpose really is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really well said. And, you know, and it changes over time, right? That purpose work. I mean, for me, as I'm nearing my 60s, you know, I'm feeling my purpose and calling is different, certainly than it was when I was in my 30s. Right. And it's and I can see that reflected more in um, my strong results, because those you know, you want to retake the strong anytime you're kind of at a changing point or a crossroads. I like to say it's like taking your temperature and just checking in with yourself. You know, I see some of my interests and the themes that I connect with the most on the strong. I see almost some interest circling back around that maybe hadn't been around since I was much younger. You know, it's like I'm almost uh, work and vocation shaped me for, you know, X amount of years, 30 years, or kind of our working years. And now when I take the strong, that's dissipating. It's more getting back to hobbies and leisure is what is, is surfacing and um, more about with investigative and artistic for me, um, really my love of just creative ideas for the sake of ideas, like even if they never get used. <laughs> Like, I'm just enjoying that again after having to, like, produce things that actually matter or are tangible or are real. I enjoy that, too. But I, sometimes I just like thinking for the sake of thinking. And so I can kind of see that, that there's a bit of a, 
just a growth a growth pattern or an arc almost. I, I think of Super's vocational development rainbow. I don't know if you remember if ever studied Donald Super, but he pictured our our career development as a rainbow almost, where it's kind of an arc instead of a straight line. Mm. That is beautiful. Yeah. So the careers you choose or the jobs you choose may change over time, and perhaps they should change over time because people change over time too. Right. Yeah. And so that's beautiful. A rainbow is a great way of putting it. Um, yeah. And, and and so I'd like to ask you a bit about the other correlations between the Myers Briggs and the strong interest inventory. Great. The letters. How do the letters correlate to the? The, the strong assessments, the JMP correlate yeah. with the personal styles. Um, yeah. Do you, are you going to be able to show that? Do you want to show you? Yes. So because like these terms are new to everyone, I will be flashing all of like the pictures that people may kind of understand. <laughs> good, good. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the personal style scales are kind of cool because those are about manifest personality. It's about how personality looks in the actual outer world. And that's what E and I and J and P help us understand is, is personality kind of expressed, you know, which part of our cognitive functions do we extrovert, which do we introvert? Um, well, the personal style scales take the general themes, so the Holland codes, and it helps you understand them more in expressed behavior. So that's what the personal styles are. And um, so on work style, which is the first of the five personal style scales, that looks at really the amount of people contact you prefer during the workday. That has very clear relationships with introversion and extroversion, but also with feelings. So I'll just tell you that introversion tends to pull left on the style scale, which makes sense that you prefer more of your workday to be alone. Extroversion correlates to the right pole which is a more people focused part of your day. Uh, but people who, um, I know feelings, not one of the outer letters, but feeling also tends to correlate with a work style score that's clear right. So it's a way to um, have that values connection with people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that one. On um, the next one is learning environment. And this one, um, has a really strong correlation with some of the cognitive functions, sensing and intuiting. So sensing prefer preferred people tend to pull left on learning environment. They prefer learning that is professionally focused and can be applied, very practical. Like, I don't wanna learn stuff I'm not gonna use. Um, and in intuition, so intuiting types, they tend to prefer more that learning for the sake of learning, which that tends to pull right. So more of the traditional kind of liberal arts model. Lots of ideas, never going to use them, doesn't matter. So um, does, that, does that resonate for you and any of your type processes? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm more on the theoretical leaning side. Yeah, I, I like to kind of learn things that have philosophical implications, but not ones that you can immediately apply in your life in any meaningful way. <laughs> right. And then um, the next one is uh, leadership. And this one also correlates with uh, introversion, extroversion. So a left, uh, a left pull on leadership that um, correlates with uh, introversion. So people who prefer not to be the leader or to more lead by example. Um, and then extroversion correlates with the right side of leadership. And those are folks who really enjoy direct people leadership, managing, inspiring, hiring, um, mentoring, things like that. So E and I on that one. And then the next one is risk. And the clear left on risk, so people who don't, um, they're not comfortable with risk really at all. And they approach change very carefully through smaller steps. There are no actual statistical correlations on type with clear left on risk. But just practically speaking, I find that a lot of my ST clients tend to, tend to pull left on risk. But the correlation data isn't there, which is interesting. But there's some very strong data that underscores the relationship between 
um, perceiving folks who like who tend to score clear right on risk. So they're really open to the experience and the opportunities. And on the strong, that's looking specifically at financial and physical risk. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's interesting, thinking tends to pull right on risk as well. There's some relationship there. And if you have a thinking and perceiving in your MBTI code, the odds of being clear right on risk are huge. So there's this interplay between thinking and perceiving that generates this more um, jump in and see how it goes uh, form of risk. And then, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I mean, when I think about the types that are T and P, you know, I, I guess I can, I can see that in terms of just, just a willingness to take risks. Yeah, I would even correlate it slightly with extroversion and introversion, mm -hmm. but there's probably no data to support that. There's but not, like, but yeah, but practically, I think as practitioners, we do see trends, you know, mm. and then for you that do this, you do this every day of your life, it'll be interesting for you to be maybe thinking about the strong more as you're yeah. witnessing behaviors and patterns. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I, if I were to infer some trends <laughs> within that, this is speculation, by the way. SJs, they're known as the guardians or mm -hmm. as the stabilizers. And so they're going to be naturally risk adverse, but it might be different than how the strong interest inventory defines risk. Exactly. So, and then the last one is team orientation. And that, again, correlates with introversion, extroversion. So clear left on team means you prefer to do team projects on your own. Take your piece. And that's introversion. And then team orientation, clear right. That's uh, lines up with extroversion, where those are folks who prefer team processes to be collaborative, lots of brainstorming, um, power day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the other scale where there's a, a actual statistical relationship between the results. Interesting. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> nice to know the correlations. How about with the occupational skills? Is there any correlation between MBTI and occupational skills? Well, there are what we might call double hits, where you look at um, like using type tables to see which types are drawn to which occupations at a higher rate than you might anticipate. Um, so you can get that information, like maybe from the uh, the interpretive the MBTI interpretive report, where you're actually going to get some job titles. Um, and then, of course, the strong generates 130 job titles and tells you how similar you are to folks in those occupations, how your similar likes, dislikes, and indifferences. And so they it would just be like which which job titles are appearing on both. Um, and there is a combined report that you can get from the publisher. It's the um, MBTI strong combined report. Um, you can also do it just side by side, like you don't have to purchase that extra report, but that extra report does integrate the two instruments for you in a really nice way, um, including all the double hits. And then it gives you another page of the single hits. So job titles that just appeared on one or the other. So mm -hmm. I don't really have any like actual empirical data that looks at the, the top basic interests with the MBTI. Um, but I can, you know, you can imagine like for your, like yourself with, as a, as an NF, um, that you probably have some top interests that are either related to, um, creativity or to, um, helping other people make their lives better. <laughs> that, that would be, you know, a guess. So there's, you know, um, I don't have my booklet with me, but in the, um, the Where Do I Go Next booklet, which is one of the strong resources. It has the basic interests and it tells you what theme they align with. So like counseling and helping is considered a social interest. Teaching and education is considered a social interest. Um, it's human resources and training is considered a social interest. So, you know, you could look at just um, tying it back to the themes. Like for me as an NT, um, it's not surprising that I have a lot of investigative interests, like 
medical science is an interest of mine. Research is an interest of mine. Mathematics is an interest of mine. So all those geeky sorts of basic interests are some of my top ones. I also have some ones that are not tied to um, um, my, my type in particular. But so I would say that there are definitely some relationships there as well. That is so rad. That is so cool. <laughs> and so that's lovely, lovely, lovely to know. And so if anyone's wondering what jargon we're throwing around, <laughs> so like, if anyone's curious, like this jargon seems interesting. I don't know what it means. So the strong interest inventory is made of four scales. The first scale is the GOT, general occupational themes. And then there's the BIS, mm -hmm. the basic interests. Yeah, the basic interest scales, and then there's the OS, occupational scales, and then there's the PSS, which is the personal styles scales. Yeah, so that's just geeky terminology if you want to learn more about the strong interest inventory. It's a great tool if you're going through a career shift in your life or you're trying to figure out where you want to take your life. Um, yeah, so on that note, I was wondering, Cheryl, what are the benefits to learning the strong interest inventory and the Myers-Briggs or the 16 types? Mm -hmm. um, what is the benefit to being on the receiving end or getting trained in them? To be on the receiving end. Yeah. So to be on the receiving end, it gives you a language to understand how you're made. It gives you a lens to view your past journey and behaviors in a way that goes like, oh, I make sense. Like for me as a, as, a, as a young girl, I didn't feel typical of like my, my girlfriends. Uh, my interests were really different than theirs. Like I wanted to learn why bugs walked and I saved up my babysitting money to buy a dissection kit. Like that's not normal behavior for a, a girl child. And uh, so always like feeling like I had a lot of really good friends, but always feeling like a little bit out of sync. And then it was, you know, through type and learning about INTJ and especially INTJ women or girls or females. It was like, wow. Now I get it. Like I get why I felt different because I was. Um, and then with the strong, you know, learning more about my interests, my motivations, my values through a different lens um, that's more focused on what do I want to major in? What university or college might be a good fit for me? Or I'm ready to start my first job doing the career exploration process to I think I need a new career. <laughs> like I need a whole new direction. I'm tired. I'm burned out. I mean, these are all things that both these instruments can help us appreciate. So mm. it's, I think it's a lot. I mean, they're both, they're both lifelong instruments, meaning that we can learn and grow from our knowledge in them throughout our life. It's not just like a one and done. Mm. I, a hundred percent agree with it. If we take these self-development tools seriously, they're more like lifestyle considerations or yeah. things that get you to think a little more, ponder a bit more about your life as a whole. You can use them in your immediate circumstance, sure, but there are so many other applicabilities as yeah. in like, do you want a tool to decipher a part of your soul? Then it could possibly help in a lot of things um, if we are able to see it as our teacher, are able to teach us a little more about mm -hmm. life, ourselves, about the world, if we just kind of let it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that appreciation for why we need each other. Like Absolutely. we literally need each other because it's, we are incomplete. And we, I mean, you don't need type in order to understand that. But once you've used type or explored type, it's like all the more clear. We all play a vital part in the ecosystem of life, and mm -hmm. it's amazing to honor our places in life, yeah. you know, how our heart of type contributes to the world at large and yeah. how we can love each other more if we just embrace and honor and celebrate each other's differences. Yeah. Like type is such a good diversity and inclusion tool. You want to figure out a way to 
respect and honor and bring out each other's differences in a productive way with each other and to spread around love instead of spreading around um yeah. into <laughs> like other oh, things yeah. Yeah. yeah type is great for learning to love things that are different than you yeah it's celebratory it really is mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yes it's celebrate instead of tolerate so. yeah oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah uh-huh my final question for you, Cheryl, is what about learning about being an INTJ really stuck out to you? You're like, wow, that is so me. Like that mm -hmm. is just so mm -hmm. me. I think it made sense of uh, interpersonal chaos that I experienced growing up or as a young adult. Um, things like... Uh, when I was a manager, a young manager, I expected people to show up and work, like park all their baggage at the door, <laughs> go into the office and work because that's how I wanted to be managed. And so that's how I managed other people. And the feedback was when I was in my 20s that I wasn't caring enough. I didn't um, take a enough time to get to know them as people. I just really had high standards and didn't check in enough and all these things. And I'm thinking, are those bad things? <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, those are bad things. You know, so it just was like, oh, okay. I, I you know, even though I'm in my 20s and I got some leadership positions very early on, I needed to change because the folks that worked under me or whatever, they didn't like the way I managed. And I was managing the way I wanted to be managed. So type was like a huge wake up call for me. And instead of having, you know, people in my wake as I went through life who were feeling hurt or misunderstood, like I could do something about that. That That's just one example of many. So. Wow. That is really poignant. <laughs> wow. And then me on the other side, I'm like, but people's feelings. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. We have like opposite approaches. <laughs> your natural approach is to be more like separate your work from your personal baggage. And I'm right. like, let's nurture all of your emotions. Let's make sure you're, you're okay on emotional well, well-being. Who would have thought that, the, that workers are emotional beings? Never had occurred to me before, you know, it's just really basic stuff, you know, because we only know what we know and all we know is what's in our own heads. That is so fascinating. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it gets us to take off the blinders and that's a really well mm -hmm. way of putting it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for coming out and bestowing your wisdom Aww. on these two tools that you spent your lifetime kind of cultivating knowledge on. Cheryl is a master MBTI practitioner, and she's also the facilitator for the Strong Interest Inventory Instrument. And she's also very good at teaching her material, a very competent NT. <laughs> Well, thank you, Joyce. It was really great to work with you in the strong, and this has been a this has been a pleasure. Your A plus facilitator, teacher of the strong, um, yeah. So I'm certified in the strong interest inventory, and Cheryl helped me through that <laughs> that journey, and it was really wonderful. She made the process very smooth, and she ran it really well, and I learned a lot. It's career information that will continue giving me value for a lifetime. So good. Thank you. Well, I hope you join <laughs> using it hopefully with some of your clients as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think the strong interest inventory will, will be really helpful in coaching certain clients I have who are looking to make major shifts in their life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Well, thanks, Joyce. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being this amazing instructor that I had the privilege to get to know mm -hmm. and your investigative strength really allows you to dig in deep and to analyze things and to really research things to its fullest form. It makes me wonder if there are correlations between the strong interest inventory and the Enneagram as well. Yeah. So, 
some of the things that you mentioned with the investigative strength, which you have very strong as an INTJ, mm -hmm. also correlate with the type five Enneagram. Yeah. So the type five Enneagram is known as the researcher or the observer or mm -hmm. the investigator. Right. Which is literally investigative and right, right. <laughs> in the strong interest inventory. And so I see the world as a giant double blind test. Mm -hmm. You have all these different instruments telling you basically the same thing. The investigative strength that's also seen in the Enneagram. What it shows is that there's a really real human phenomenon yes. that these two of these separate instruments that don't talk to each other reached at the same thing. Right. So in some way, this personality difference is really real because no matter where you look at it, you'll see different places confirming its reality. And so just like the Enneagram <laughs> type five and the investigative theme in the strong interest inventory, it shows how there's something really real to personality because yeah. everyone's seeing it and they're not, talking to each other and influencing each other. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's, good. That's true. Yeah. And, and when that, that common pattern is emerging, you know, you're onto something. Yeah. Uh-huh. So thank you for enlightening us on the correlations mm -hmm. between you, these two instruments. You are a joy to talk to and you really helped clarify some of the similarities and the differences. And you're making a real difference in the careers of people's mm -hmm. lives. You're helping them find what interests them. And through interests, you open a lot of doors for them. Right. So you are a door opener, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> That's my retirement task. I'll say, after you. <laughs> oh, that is great. All right. So all right. thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I'll see you all in the next episode. Bye, everyone. <music>